My full-time job is to teach IT at Multimedia University, College. Part-time, I'm on Kicktonet. I moderate a bit of Kicktonet issues. <laughs> and also, I sit on the Afrinic board. So I was... Oops. There's a position that is not healthy. Eh? Yeah, I know. It. <laughs> it, uh, I was saying that I would have wished to be here in the morning, just this afternoon I can see the sessions are quite lively and I must have missed quite a lot. Um, I would like to indulge you, I know you're probably very tired, but this last session, I'm told almost half of the people may not show up, so it's not as long as it looks like on the, on the, on the handout. Uh, we actually have three presenters, uh, the introductory by Gigi, regulations by Victor Copio, and Chachi Rotino from Nation Newspapers. So I would uh, seek your indulgence that we do those three presentations and then thereafter we wrap up. Thank you. Gigi first. Um, I'm just going to do a very quick uh, introduction on uh, what intermediary liability is all about. Because when uh, uh, Chris Babu said we, we held a we had a participatory process to decide on the topics for Kenya IGF. And, um, you know, these were some of the suggestions. But a lot of people have come to me offline and asking, you know, what is this intermediary liability? So I'm just, I think I only have four slides and I just want to explain before uh, Victor, who really understands the issue, can give us something on regulation. And then, uh, um, for once, nation is here, and uh, you know they can tell us how they deal with this whole issue because I know I have tested their their, their blog and I have put some hate speech there, and it didn't pass. So like you know, after every hour, I would monitor, I would get a message. It's under moderation. Finally, there was no moderation, and my comment was not there, and it was not on. There. So it means they do take liability. Um, okay, as an introduction, internet um, uh, intermediaries can be looked at as go-betweens. Uh, they act between two parties on the internet, enabling the transmission and sharing of information. So you and I communicate on email, you and I communicate through uh, our blogs, but how is that facilitated? So we have an intermediary that allows us to do that. Um, so they allow us to communicate, they allow us to provide and share information, they allow us to share content of all types, from email, to entertainment, to hate speech, to everything. Copyright issues, etc. Uh, however, what is important is that, you know, they do not make decisions on what passes, on what content passes through them. So for example, if you and I are exchanging an email, um, you know, it's Yahoo or we are chatting. Say we are using Zoom. So we are online and it's real time. Hi, Victor. Uh, that chat is location match is crappy. So you respond, oh yes, it's crappy. So it allows us to pass, but you know, it doesn't make that decision on what we say. Next slide. Now, Examples of intermediary liabilities. These are internet service providers, their data processing and web hosting providers. Search engines are also internet, uh, internet intermediaries. Participative networking platforms, you know, the Facebooks, the Twitters, you know, they are participating, those are intermediaries. Um, they, you know, YouTube, it allows us to publish, to broadcast all these platforms. Um, that themselves do not create or own the content being published uh, or broadcast. And I, I guess a good example also, nation, you know, when there's an article, there's also a blog where readers can contribute. And uh, apart from that time when I realized you do actually monitor what goes on, um, at times what you also allow, you don't necessarily make decisions on what people have to say. Uh, from an African perspective, it is also important to consider mobile service providers as intermediaries. 
since we all know that mobile uh, telephony continues to set the stage for adoption of internet access in Africa, even though they are regulated under telecom laws. So, you know, they are different from the other ISPs in terms of how they are regulated. Next slide. Now, the role of intermediaries, um, and I have alluded to this, but through their infrastructure platforms, they provide access, they host, they transmit, they index uh, content originated by third parties, or provide internet-based services to third parties. They facilitate social communication and information exchange. They also, uh, we assume they protect personal information in the online environment because for some reason we are able to say things that we, we might not be able to say to people openly. Mm -hmm. um, so they sort of provide some, I will quote it, they sort of provide some sort of trust um, for us. So they enable that individuality and self-expression and therefore offer potential improvements to quality of societies in terms of fundamental values such as freedom um, and democracy. You know, we are, we, we are very happy when we sit uh, you know, behind, uh, behind screens and um, you know, we can say anything knowing that you know, this is really freedom to express. The other thing is that you know you can sign in as a different name and then say everything you have wanted to say to anybody without fear or favor or prejudice. Uh, internet intermediaries then help um, uh, in the transmission in the dissemination process, but remember they do not initiate decisions to disseminate the content, products, or services that go through their networks or servers. Next slide. Now, liability. Intermediary liability arises where governments or private litigants can hold ISPs or providers liable for unlawful or harmful content created by users of those services. So when we communicate, some of us disregard issues of copyright. Um, some of us uh, you know, there have been issues of fraud, for example, with credit cards. There have been issues of impersonation, cybercrime, child pornography. Um, and, and when we put that content, we put it through, uh, say, Safaricom or Zuku, um, it might be easier for governments or private uh, litigants to sue Zuku or to sue Safaricom. And that happens because Safaricom has an office, it can be located, it has an address, and above all, very fat bank accounts. <laughs> so it's very easy to sue them, uh, as opposed to suing Grace Daika, because even if you sue me, man, I have nothing. So I guess the best you can get out of is having me put in for three months, but you won't get any money. So it's easier to sue Safaricom or to sue Zoom. Um, so that's my introduction. A big hand for Gigi there. Um, I've just now learned a lot about this intermediary liability and I'm a bit worried because, you know, I said I moderate Kicktown. So some of those head speeches, I hope I'm not taken somewhere. <laughs> or, oh, <laughs> already? <laughs> Yeah, so this, this online exchange can actually take a, an ugly legal turn, so we need to be very careful. And perhaps Victor, Victor Copio, I would like to give you the floor now, so that you uh, break it down in to better depth this issue. Ten minutes so that we can have time for questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Walu and Lindsay uh, for that great introduction. At least by now, I think uh, we are all on the same page on what um, uh, the role of the intermediary is and uh, the kind of liability uh, that they may face. Uh, I just want to uh, do a brief overview of uh, the legal environment uh, in which we work. And, um, 
comes just like shape function. Uh, the ISP is one initial access if I call it ETC. This is what um, we do. So, a few issues first before we look at the kind of liability. The challenge of the internet. And uh, one of it um, is conflict of law. Um, we have a constitution that talks about supremacy of the people, supremacy of the constitution. Uh, now, all general rules of international law are part of Kenyan law, those which are ratified, uh, the treaties and conventions. Uh, that's an area which is problematic. Uh, the other issue is like uh, what Gigi was talking about, you can hide behind the screen. Uh, there is the real world and there is the cyber world. How do we treat both? Uh, uh, do we treat cyber as same as real world? Or do we treat it as an entirely different um, area? Uh, the question of uh, jurisdiction. The internet has no boundaries. Uh, there are multinationals operating in several countries. How do we deal with that? The other issue is uh, the conceptual understanding. What are the issues? We have problems, definitions. Some have not been defined, some are not clear. The various jurisdictions, people define things differently. That is also a problematic issue. And of course, anonymity. You can go under pseudonym, you can hide behind physical proxies, and so on and so forth. But um, very quickly, um, if we look at the Constitution, and this has been alluded to in the morning, right to privacy, at all that long, um, <coughs> intermediaries, you have your emails too, uh, and the police come and search, you have Dr. Ndemu talking about you are going to be checking emails. <laughs> yeah, the Constitution is a supreme law, so you know. Um, you have the right to privacy, you know. What are the limitations? Um, to government interference with that, right? Uh, we have the Data Protection Bill, at the same time, Official Secrets Act. Um, what, 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 you know, what, what impact does it have on the role of intermediaries? Um, so, that is a problematic area, and you can see that, lab, uh, that uh, intermediaries um, in, in conducting the service, you have emails come and say, okay, you want to check this one because you see it on the free. Uh, you sent us a message, we want to check this, but you know you have a right to privacy. Um, the question of records, you know, do they have to, how long do they have to keep these things? The law, the law is very silent on the duration. So if you want to investigate an email that you sent in 2005, is uh, Google, for example, uh, bound to store that information for all these years, uh, or even the local companies, your SMSs that you sent in 2007, if they say they want to investigate now. Those are issues. And of course, the cost um, for some of these uh, ISPs and uh, intermediaries. The other thing is, and uh, that's 32, freedom. We have freedom of conscience, religion, belief, and opinion. <coughs> You can express yourself. The internet provides an avenue for expression. You have the, right, the freedom of expression. You can impart ideas. What are the limitations um, to freedom of expression? You have the question of hate speech, as we really talked about. Um, people will go and uh, file suits asking the, the intermediaries and ISPs. We want you to reveal who posted. We want to reveal the identity of who owns this website, where this material has been, has been put. You see, uh, we want it to be taken down. So these are areas where you can see that sometimes um, they tend to limit the expression when you start blogging sites and doing those kind of things. Um, the other thing is freedom of the media, at least to have some information. And Gigi had talked about um, some of the comments being <coughs> moderated. Uh, what are the limitations? Uh, you know, when you moderate freedom of expression, you must strike a balance. Uh, freedom of the media to express themselves 
and uh, them to be held liable uh, confiscation of equipment we've seen standard uh, happen. The other thing I also talked about in the morning, right to access information. The internet plays a very important role in you know, access and provide access. Uh, this is just Google and everything. Um, how can intermediaries facilitate and when they block some sites are they interfering with this right to access information? For example, if Google closed at CO.j, you know, what effect would that have? Or if they're told to uh, block it for some reason. Uh, freedom from discrimination. Uh, we have both in terms of practice when legislation requires um, ISPs to do certain things, then you'll find that they can discriminate services, uh, the offering of the services. Sometimes when you post information online, and uh, then they start discriminating, you're not going to take the service to this place because of one, two, three, four, five reasons. And of course, there are other social, economic, and cultural rights. The right to property, and including intellectual property. Uh, what about property in the cloud? We're talking about hosting. Who owns the information? Yes, they say it is yours. But when the government says we want this because we investigate one, two, three, four, you know, who has the authority to uh, give uh, or reveal this kind of information? Right to a clean and healthy environment. Environment we just left uh, Rio Plastic the other day. And, um, you know, we're saying that ICTs contribute a lot to global warming. One day somebody will go to court and say, shut down the summer farm because it's, it's, you know, it is uh, injuring the right to a clean and healthy environment. The other thing is um, consumer rights, the quality of goods and services, um, information, um, health and safety, compensation for defective goods and services. Fair, honest, decent advertise. Uh, we talked today is a consumer protection bill. And uh, recently, you remember Safaricom withdrew its unlimited internet. They say it's limited by smart. So, <laughs> someone might go to court and say, you know, I, I want my unlimited internet. So, you see, that is also an area where the liability might come into question. Um, the other thing is, Article 47, 48, and 50, uh, right to fair, expeditious, and efficient administrative action, access to justice, fair hearing. Remember, I um, think <coughs> someone had mentioned SafariCon, um, the process that uh, was, <laughs> was used to take it down. Uh, you know, where is due process in, in this whole thing? When somebody wants to go and say this, yes, but you follow due process. Um, ISPs can also be liable um, criminally. Um, we have sexual offenses. Um, it's, you mean it's a crime under Section 12 of the Act um, to promote sexual offenses through distribution, supply, or display of content, um, promotion of child sex tourism, child pornography distribution. And you know, we can see that what's the effect on social media? Uh, when you have people having websites. And you see, the wording of the law is distribution. And you can see that if you're an ISP and you're distributing, you know, uh, you're sending emails. It's not yours, but you're providing an opportunity for sending. But you know, the way the law has been written, it doesn't differentiate or distinguish the ISP from the individual who's actually doing the sending. And of course, under the Act, Communication Act, you have publication of, or transmission of obscene information, whether through SMSs or through online. We also talked about hate speech and the penal code, which is criminal. And I think there has been some action, Safari Com, saying that you know, they are going to monitor SMSs uh, from political parties, which is a, a good start. Uh, typical real world crimes also. Uh, problematic for theft, extortion, forgery, and you can see the role of the internet and the role of um, ISPs and other telcos. 
we have in Tasanam. At least now you can get your money back. Um, <coughs> you know, because, but what is the procedure? Um, can you say Safari Gom or, or Orange Kenya is, is, um, is facilitating the commission of crime because they have not provided a mechanism uh, for resolution of that kind of thing? How do they facilitate uh, the police investigations? Can you say that uh, they are obstructing uh, legal processes or obstructing justice uh, by not providing information to the police? Threats to national security. Um, Al Shabaab is on Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> these, these are challenges. Um, how do you, as the government, um, get Facebook or Twitter to. Now there's geolocation. Sometimes you can. How do you get that kind of information to prevent um, crimes? Um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned this. Um, under the Communications Act, Section 31, is, it doesn't allow interception, disclosure of messages, uh, content, or statements of accounts. And how do you balance this with what Dr. Ben was saying? Because the Act says it's illegal. And the government is saying that, hey, we're going to check, we're going to intercept. You know, are they shooting themselves in the foot? They need to fast fix them up. Um, the biggest challenge. Um, legally, usually come civil, and um, we can see this in the common law of statute. Um, firstly, the resolution of information. The internet provides an avenue for publication uh, or communication to a broad, a broad number of people. Because if you look at my evidence, and you say this guy is a thief, post. <coughs> It's already defamatory content, and the internet makes it very easy for people to post this kind of messages. And as an as a as an intermediary, um, when you are the owner of the website and someone is posted, what steps are you taking to deal with that? Um, if you knew it existed, because it's element of knowledge, and um, because it's a continuum. If someone has made a request to be taken down, um, how fast have you reacted? Have you ignored such requests? Or how are you dealing with such uh, requests? Uh, recently, I think about two weeks ago, um, the court required those bow up on the coast. And there were some defamatory uh, posts on the Facebook site. And they went to court and the judge ordered them to remove and take down the post. And so at least the courts are starting to take action on these issues. Um, issues of negligence. Um, when the ISP says that they have not known, uh, were they under duty uh, to know uh, the kind of information um, that was there? And more importantly, uh, we have contract. The law of contract is very applicable. Um, how many guys, how many of you here read your service agreements? <laughs> you want to get the connection so fast, but they usually tell you, uh, write your name here, turn it and sign here, then pay. <laughs> Do we ever read these terms because um, there are exclusion clauses which uh, most service providers put in these contracts where they say we shall not be liable for one, two, three and four. Um, and how do you hold them for breach? Uh, let's take, just go back to, let's say, the, say internet service, and you say, um, what is, uh, if you're buying data bundles, and you know, you, you know, you use and then you can't account to it. Do you get 100 MB, or they're like, you know, 70 at the end of the day. You know? So, these issues, when you look at the sale of goods, are, and uh, what is the role of, you know, what is the good here? Uh, is it a service, is it a good? The law is a bit sound, but if you are to, because at least you can count bundles, uh, you know, is this ISP and, um, and a duty to provide, you know, when the internet is down, you know, should they compensate you for that, for that time? These are not trusted. 
um, fitness for purpose, um, goods to correspond to the description. At least the unlimited internet has been taken down. But the questions of throttling, uh, when they limit your speeds, yet, you know, they say you're on a um, 20 Mbps connection. And then, you know, you're only getting, when you do speed test, you can only get 1 Mbps. You're getting value for money. Is it theft? Is it obtaining by fraudulent means? You know? <laughs> you know these things um, need to be tested. Is it breach of contract? Because when you sign, they say 20 MVPs. When you start using, the first week is fast. But after week two, everything just uh, you know, goes down. So I mean, how do you deal with that? Um, the questions of um, tort and interference with business relations. Um, because we find that when people post, um, probably let's give an example which is coming to. Um, like the Safari you know, um, because this website was hosted on another uh, service by another company. So how do these guys come and sit on the table and say that we are, let's say, the Internet Service Providers Association, that is successful, and you are the one who hosted that site <laughs> that was DC, uh, my company. And the other thing, um, Companies can be liable for emotional distress under tort, pain and suffering, let's say breach of privacy. You remember linking the passwords. <laughs> so can you see them that so distressed? Yeah, or when viruses, for example, and all this spam, how do we deal with who should we hold responsible? Is it the ISP for opening up to everything? Or should they have mechanisms um, to protect um, their users? Moving on, um, one of the critical areas, especially, and I wanted to deal with this last is uh, intellectual property rights. And uh, most important, of course, is copyright. Um, <coughs> basically, using or sharing what you don't own uh, without permission of the owner. Um, with now Web 2.0, we're seeing a lot of user generated content, blogs, you can create a much touch of button. But the authenticity, who owns it? How do you protect um, the copyright um, or um, the owners? And we have a Copyright Act, uh, and of course, the International Conventions, and Convention Act. Um, how do you determine fair use? What's the responsibility of, um, let's say, service providers uh, when they encounter um, copyright issues? They uh, block the sites. Uh, what should they do? And I think people can still go to court to sue them uh, when they fail to take down uh, information which breaches uh, copyright. The other thing is um, database protection, which is sort of like a match for both copyright and patent. And you remember the case of Google and locality, you know, the stealing of it's a stealing. <laughs> but we know what they did. So that's also a challenge. I don't know what finally happened. I think they sat on the table and agreed with some numbers. But <laughs> you can clearly see that uh, there are issues there. Um, the other thing is trademark. Um, we have a trademark act and the Madrid agreement and protocols of the country is signatory. Uh, basically, confusion. And we have these SAC sites, um, Safari Code website, we have seen. Uh, Dali Figures, Apple Sacks, I hate Toyota. Uh, we also seen a lot of type of squatting, cyber squatting. You've seen iPhone 5, uh, Apple is now back in, how to get back. You know. We also seen now on social media there is name squatting. I think on Twitter there is Alfred and Twelve is not really Alfred and Twelve. <laughs> Those are issues. So who should be a lab? If he went to Twitter and asked them, who should be held responsible uh, when you cannot authenticate uh, the real uh, owner of some of this? And of course, a uh, white house and dispute resolution mechanism, and of course, even within the registries, uh, there are some ways of resolving that. Um, Industrial Property Act, Protection of Patents, 
to graphical indications and other IP issues. And also the TRIPS argument, very useful, especially trade and business secrets. Uh, when you get a formula, I think I see some saying that uh, the Coca Cola formula has just been leaked. <laughs> what, what if it was true? And you know, internet is copy and paste. You can't burn copy and paste. But you know, how do you deal with it once it's out? Um, we are seeing a lot of espionage going on through the net. Um, who should be held uh, responsible uh, for this? And of course, ISPs are playing a role because people are hiding behind proxies and all these things. <laughs> so, as I conclude, uh, there are some trends uh, right now in the international arena. Various countries are taking certain measures. Um, for example, blocking websites, you know, like so we, we, we shut down into the um, In India, uh, there was a case where um, the court was asked to block um, IRP. And um, just last week, they had to lift the decision so that people could put in access. But now, blocking specifically the IP which had that link. You have US software actor questions, eradication of pointers by service providers like Google so that they don't point to uh, certain sites, uh, domain name seizure, like upload for those who are using, and uh, now they can't access. And now the users are going to go saying that, hey, uh, we want to access what we have stored. So <laughs> now presents uh, some problem. Uh, when it comes to money, at least um, before we didn't have MPESA regulations, but at least now there's some regulation even here locally. Um, in the US, at least, uh, service providers are exemplifying the ability for copyright infringement, uh, what is called the safe harbor provision. Those are cases where Icon versus YouTube, uh, where they are considered YouTube. Uh, for having content uh, on YouTube, which was infringing the copyright. Uh, but you know, YouTube, uh, they, they actually don't post, uh, people post, but the court, I don't hold them liable. Um, and, um, the EU also has some regulation uh, that categorize how um, ISPs and other intermediaries can be held liable, uh, whether they're conduits, caching and posting. And of course, last week there was a cookie law, probably if you've gone to any .co.uk site, you've seen a small bottle asking you to uh, accept cookies or reject cookies. Questions of neutrality. If ISPs and others are to limit or block sites, uh, is there a conflict of interest? Censorship issues come up. Uh, proportionality of action. Uh, those are cases in India where, like I said, they were blocking. They blocked everything, but now others were not able to use the service. So those are issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, when you give ISPs or government agencies the authority to be the investigators, the decision makers, then what where does that leave the judiciary? Because there must be some due process. Uh, of course, social media. So, way forward quickly, um, there is need for self regulation, uh, co regulation, and also um, legislation. Of course, there is need for implementation of due process, uh, notices to take down procedures, time frames, and roles for intermediaries. And uh, of course, we require partnerships, some will require change of business models. Of course, we will also need pro probably new approaches to IPR. Uh, of course, the internet now changes its dynamic. How do we treat copyright? How do we treat patent? Um, you know, now you just hit the share button. You know, what if it was copyright you know, So this share anti uh, on Twitter, they present challenges to IP regime. This is for consumer education. And of course, the law is still behind. And it needs to catch up with the developments on a regular basis. And um, last but not least, um, ignorance of the law is no defense, so you cannot say you do not know, uh, even if it didn't exist. And uh, lastly, uh, just a disclaimer, um, I don't consider this legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Kopi, I think he deserves a big hand. Um, I do know there's so many ways I consume my ISP. So thank you for all those tips. And I think I'll also advise my son. He's always wanted to be a cop, but now I can tell him to be a lawyer. There seems to be many ways of earning money. Uh, very quickly moving on to the last presentation, Churchill of Tiena. Uh, please, 10 minutes so that we can have time for one or two questions. Welcome. Well, I used to be friends. We had a few eyes then. What happened? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm told it's a Friday, and uh, this kind of uh, hour, people would rather be doing something more interesting than and listening to big words from Grace and uh, myself. So I'll, I'll try and keep it short. Let me know if it takes five minutes. Cut and uh, do the rest on Twitter. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> my name is, as you've heard, is Chachi Lutino. I'm the managing editor who worries about what we should put in this place. Um, I'll go a bit into that in a short time. Uh, but I got worried when I got uh, the invitation to come and speak here from this. It contained three big words internet, intermediary liability. <laughs> I only happened to spy on that uh, email. And he got very, very worried because, uh, from his perspective, an intermediary is somebody who helps young men who are not very good with their uh, uh, fair uh, gender. <laughs> so, <after> some, <laughs> so he was worried yeah, what he was going to be about. But I'm thankful I don't have to explain it because uh, they've done a good job in telling us what it means. But why is the nation talking about being called in to uh, discuss for discussion where those three big words are the guiding weapons? I could explain that by trying to tell you what you know what is what nation is. Yeah. Nation started uh, about 60 years ago, as a newspaper company, just to help give uh, indigenous Kenyans some voice as we fought for independence. So there are, there are several parallels between how nation has grown uh, and how Kenya has come to be where it is today. But more critically, uh, why you started off as a newspaper company in the 90s? The company came to recognize that they, need, they needed to communicate through channels beyond the print media. So we went to TV, we went to radio. And of course, the company then changed to national media group instead of national newspapers. A few years later, I think less than five years, they realized the need to go online. And uh, the daily nation went online in 1998. Of course, there was a question of we still call ourselves a media group, or we now call ourselves an anti media group. And the media group has stayed to date. But in terms of uh, storytelling, we tell our stories through channels uh, uh, on print, on broadcast, the traditional broadcast in the United States, TV and radio, and now also on the digital media. But what stories do we talk about? Nation today has a vision to be the media of Africa for Africa. And for us, that means that uh, our hope, our mission is to tell the African story from an African perspective. That's one. And two, to explain the Africanness in that story in the context of the global uh, conversation as we go forward. And it's interesting because. Uh, if that argument was to be taken to a logical conclusion, then one would argue that this meeting is not being held in Africa. But if it were being held in Africa, then probably the whole 
will be round instead of being square. Good for thought, but somebody argues that why is it that African hats are always around it? Many think that that speaks to the quality in our philosophy, but I guess that's a story for another day. But I told you the nation story is to try and bring out uh, how we've evolved in terms of opportunities. And the one thing that has been consistent is the need for us to tell the story. That we're willing to tell the story and we will go whatever length. We will embrace whatever new medium comes by that will help us tell that story. So the loyalty is to that story. But increasingly, we are realizing that we don't own the story. We don't have uh, all that there is to say about this, that story. That's one. Two, that new media, the new platforms that are emerging, are more supportive to help us make sure that at the end of the day, the whole story is told. And that brings in very, very powerfully the aspect of how do you embrace the audience to help you tell this story so that you don't assume that you have, you have, the perspective that you have is the one and only perspective that there is. And that's what drove us as we built our websites to try and put in a very, very strong element for that audience to come back in and have their say. But no sooner did we start that than we were told, oh, you can't do that. You can't just let guys come in and have their say. You have to be accountable for what they say. In short, what, what the lawyers are telling us is that <clears throat> if Grace asks me to come and speak here, and if I say things and you guys respond, and in the process something that could be challenged in law emerges, that you should not be held accountable, I should not be held accountable, but the hotel should be. <laughs> Maybe it's right. Thankfully, we have Victor to help us with that thinking. Maybe it's not. But more importantly, I think for you, is uh, our experience in that space. Having learned that, we, we took the decision and the attitude that being a business, you can't then just allow the risk for that to happen. So we took a different decision that all user comment, all user contributions that are coming on to mention websites, and there are 16 of them, as you know, in Kenya. The big one being a nation, which serves about more than a million pages every day. But you're saying that any user content that comes into that space will be moderated. Moderation happens in two main ways. There's what we call pre-publishing moderation, which means that you make that contribution as a public, but before the rest of the world can see it, somebody at nation will look at it and say yes. Please. Other places in, elsewhere in the world take the view that you're generally responsible people, you know what, why you do the things you do, you know why you want to say the things you want to say, and after all, it's your constitutional right anyway. So if they allow you to make that comment, it goes, it gets published and everybody consumes of it, if there's any issue, then they moderate after publishing. Yeah? But we take the first, the first uh, uh, option. We've learned many lessons with it. Uh, I think the only media house who have been sued based on what users have said. But we've tried to just uh, cleanse our act in that space, and uh, we came up with uh, some uh, six simple rules to guide uh, the public in engaging in that space. And, and they speak mostly to taste, they speak a bit to just call up, uh, to law in terms of libel and defamation. Let's call, let's call it up. Uh, and the rest of it is just mostly operational. But this, that page is on uh, the nation, all nation websites, at the bottom, and then we need logos. But these six tenets, so to speak, guide uh, 
is what we give um, the public to guide how they engage with us. And these are the same rules that we give our moderators. And every comment that comes through needs to conform to those rules. Thank you, Chai Chin, and have a round of applause for him. Thank you. It's true, me and Chai Chin come from quite a distance. When they were starting to do the online blog, I was actually used as a guinea pig. I wrote for him a few blogs for almost a month. Thereafter, he became too successful and moderated me out. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, I think we can take one, two, three optimal questions so that we wrap up this session early. And maybe the best is we just get them in a row, the first three. Ali, go for it. My question is actually for a regulator, and I don't see one here. Okay, well, was it deliberate? I wonder. Okay, anyway, now, from a, from a regulator perspective, maybe you guys can uh, assist us here, because you probably dealt with it. Um, what is the position of the, of the regulator when it comes to blogs? Specifically, are bloggers held to the same high standards as mainstream journalism? Um, the reason why I'm saying this is, um, I doubled myself in my blog once in a while when I have time. But the, the main point here is we have <clears throat> some very prolific bloggers in the country today who don't, in my own personal opinion, don't take the time to find, um, to verify the information that they have. So they sometimes, more often than not, tend to defend people. Some of them have gone actually to the point of being extremely defamatory, to the extent of being abusive, uh, and that is going on. Uh, what's your opinion about this, and what can be done? Because uh, in my humble opinion, uh, a few of these, what happens is that they, they mess up the whole, the whole field. I'm not saying people shouldn't blog, people should blog, they should continue to blog, but if you're doing that, can it at least come from a point of view that a semblance that you have to at least done your homework? Thank you. I think we don't have regulators, but many lawyers are in the house, they could assist us. Any other question? Okay, who we want to copy, you want to respond to me? Well, probably I'd say um, that um, regulation of you know blogs is maybe something which is well, there's no specific category which regulates uh, uh, the blog sphere. Uh, but at least for professional journalists, they have their various codes of ethics. Uh, but for the general public, uh, who are also bloggers, uh, you can look at it as uh, freedom of speech freedom of expression and it is within their own right. But um, of course that right um, stops uh, where it uh, is now uh, contrary to provisions of the law when it becomes uh, defamatory, when it becomes hate speech. Uh, then action needs to be taken. When it's hate speech of course there is in the, the commission in charge, of course there is a police, but also is incumbent on people who see these kind of things, um, to report when it's criminal uh, or when it's defamatory, um, then the people so defend uh, to take action and go to court or something to have them taken down. There's also a role for ISPs uh, who host um, such kind of forums where people um, can express themselves uh, because <coughs> Um, they cannot say, in as much as they are not under duty per se to monitor the kind of content that uh, are on their sites, but if they receive complaints, uh, then of course.
because it's still a gray area because there's no really legal mechanisms uh, to provide uh, procedures for dealing with this because in the states you have the notice to take down that people can take down. Uh, but here, you know, the, there's really no law. So if, in as much as it is criminal or uh, violating the law, uh, the procedure and uh, you know the responsibility for taking action is still gray area, but that doesn't mean action cannot be taken. Just to add that uh, there's also an aspect of that that falls back to us who are on the front line or in that space. Because uh, the liberty that such kind of law does take is the same liberty that we used to enjoy the rights we enjoy in those spaces. Yeah, so, so I guess the, the onus is on us to then challenge them because really uh, what makes them influential is the reputation that they bring. And that reputation is informed by who is following them, who is listening to them. Yeah. So if we can call out those moments, if we can call out and show how uh, inaccurate the inaccuracies that we bring through, then <coughs> together as a, as a community, then we are able to, to bring some uh, uh, element of order in that space. Maybe I could also share, there was another case of uh, Yahoo. Yahoo were, uh, you know, trading in Hitler's uh, artifacts, you know. They sell things that Hitler used, uh, and in the U.S. it's legal. But I think some countries in Europe, France and Germany, it's illegal. So what to do? You know, you have advertised Hitler's boots on your Yahoo, and somebody in France sees that and buys the boots. So when the boots land at the airport, they are confiscated. <laughs> And you've already paid for them. So in short, this, this space is, is, is quite uh, a gray area and it's still emerging. And there are likely to be more uh, difficult situations in the future. One more question, or we... I think I'm through, Gigi. No further questions. i take the mic back to you. Uh, thanks, Walu. Uh, we are finally coming to an end of this session. Uh, so I just would like to... Oh, there was a question. Okay. Uh... You can maybe uh, take legal actions. Okay, it's for right? Yeah. What if I use uh, an anonymous... If I use an anonymous identity to post Disformation. How do you address How do you address that? Uh, for you to be able to comment on our sites, we require that you register. And the only check that we really can put in place is that you have a valid email address. Beyond that, it becomes a bit helpless. Yeah. Again, today you can you are able to comment via your Facebook profile or your Twitter handle. So. That's the best we can do in that space. Now, tied to what he's saying that the only check they have is that someone has an email address. Today I can open an email address and really Yahoo doesn't know if that's my age, my name, or really I exist. So in other words, are you telling us that you truly don't have a check anyway? <laughs> Yeah. A fake. A fake. Yeah. 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 The purpose of posting. Let's create a fake identity. For the purpose of posting, and I do the post to post. Oh, uh, the microphone for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to emphasize that we don't moderate the people. We moderate the content that they bring to us. Yeah. So, if you, whether your profile is fake or not, as long as the content you are putting on our website meets our standards, we should be okay. okay. Yeah, I, I think something that I need to also uh, report is that you know media is also regulated, um, and there's a code of ethics, there's a code of conduct. 
And uh, in as much as uh, we contribute, say, to the national standard uh, blogs, they make sure that you don't uh, get, you know, breach the code. So that's why Churchill is saying whether you put a fake profile, they will still moderate what you put out there. That content is moderated. So it doesn't matter whether it's fake, but if what you say, you know, remember in the morning they said uh, um, even freedom of speech has limitations. So a lot of media is guided by that. And he can tell you there's so many lawsuits. Kenya Times, when it closed, I'm told it had lawsuits that would fill Jakaranda Hotel. <laughs> um, you know, so the media is also very careful when it deals with those comments. And like I said when I was introducing, I actually tested their blog and put in some comments that I knew were hate speech. It, no, it didn't see the light of day. 